Good morning. I've been, I've been up, I've been thinking, and before I even move forward, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to my church family. Thank you to, your hearts are so big. What you did yesterday, it just goes beyond words that I could express. I'm so grateful today. I'm so grateful today for the love that you all have shown. I know yesterday, uh, you all, <laughs> you all know I'm a crybaby. Some people don't know that about me, but you all know that. And as you can see, this room is lit up this morning with the love that you all have shown to this house. And, um, uh, and we are so grateful, so grateful that you all uh, love us the way you do. And um, I, I just, I don't know. Thank, thank you, thank you so much. This, this meant so much to me. I haven't been able to really see uh, my church family, but you all pulled this one out. Y'all pulled this one off, and. Um, And I, I brought this because I know me. Y'all know me. So I just had to get this out. My heart is so touched this morning because, um, because of you. Because of your commitment. I miss my IPC family. I love you, Pastor. Hope to be back soon. We love you, Pastor King. IPC planted. We miss you, Pastor King and Missy King, First Lady. We love you, uh, Pastor King, First Lady. IPC, we love you. You are appreciated. Um, I mean, it's just balloons. For all that you are, for all that you do, thank you. And so, uh, my heart, my heart is is full this morning and I wanted to get that out of the way and just let you all know that you are appreciated as well you know that I never expected that you know I was out there to serve and then um as you all could see from the video that was posted that I thought it was um I actually thought it was a graduation a graduation that somebody was celebrating for uh, somebody that had graduated or something and when I looked in the first car, I saw Tab, and after Tab, I saw uh, another church member, and then I saw another one, and another one, and then I, uh, I saw one of the signs, and I realized that this was, um, this was for for me, for us. So, um, so thank you once again. And so now that I think I did pretty good, I got through that. <laughs> Gosh, y'all, y'all know me. <laughs> Thank you for helping me get through that. So, um, so now I, I I have to teach, and I'm so glad that I didn't break all the way down. And so I'm I still have something left because I know that it is uh it is very important that I'm able to teach uh this morning. And so uh, I want you to uh, get your Bible, and we're going to proceed with uh, our message this morning which will be coming from uh, Acts chapter 3. I'm so glad that I was able to hold this together because I would not have been able to teach. And so uh, I'm stronger than I thought I was. Uh, but my church, Inner Peace Church, you all are amazing. You all are amazing. And I would not trade this journey with you all for anything. And so uh, thank you. Uh, Acts chapter 3 very familiar passage of scripture that I'm going to uh, take us to. Uh, let us pray first.
Father, we thank you so much for uh, this beautiful morning that you've given us. We give you honor today uh, because of who you are. You are still seated uh, in the heavenlies. You are still on the throne. You are still in control. We give honor to you because you, you, you alone are worthy to be praised. We, we exalt you, God. We, we, we love you because you first loved us. I pray uh, for the spirit of grace to be in our message this morning that you would uh, speak to us however you choose to speak to us. I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds, open up our spiritual ears that we may hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We pray, God, for uh, spiritual impartation, uh, that you would uh, download into our hearts uh, something that will help us as we move forward uh, in our purpose, in our callings. Uh, we pray, God, that you would give us spiritual eyes that we may see the things that you put before us, God. I pray that you would uh, lift our spirit of discernment, that we may be able to discern on a higher level than we were able to before. I pray also that you would give us peace in our hearts, minds, and our spirit. And I pray, God, that you give us understanding as it relates to uh, the direction that you are taking this nation. I also pray, God, that you would help us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, that we would uh, allow him to use us even in this season, God, I pray that we would um, keep our options open and that we would uh, be sensitive to this, the leading and the guiding, guiding of your Holy Spirit, God, that we may be where you would have us to be in the moment that you would choose us to be there. We pray for every listener. Uh, we pray for those, God, um, who are going through, who are struggling uh, through this pandemic. We pray, God, that you would provide everyone's needs according to your riches and glory. I pray that I would decrease, that you would increase in me, and that you would use me to proclaim what the scripture says. And we'll be careful to give you all the honor, the praise, and the glory, for we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, in Acts chapter 3, um, I want to talk, God has impressed upon my heart to talk about the parking lot ministry, the parking lot ministry. And um, I actually gained... Um, my understanding from Acts chapter 3, and I'm kind of correlating it to what's going on in our society today. Um, I was in a panel discussion yesterday, and we were pretty much talking about um, the church before COVID-19, the church during COVID-19, and the church after COVID-19. And one of the questions that, um, that came up in the discussion is, um, will we be able to return to church the way we left it you know will church be the same will there be a lot of changes and will we even be able to go back to what used to be and uh i was under the impression uh that there there is no going back to the way things used to be and and i may mention that when god closes some doors he closes them in such a way that you cannot reopen them you know, so uh, I believe that God is a progressive God. I need somebody to type that in. I, I, I believe that God is a progressive God. In essence, what I'm saying is that he is a God who, that believes and pushes the momentum forward. I believe that God is a progressive God. And I believe that, you know, uh, with all of what's going on around us and what's going on in the churches, outside the churches, and how things have taken a sudden change, that we have to be able to adapt to the new norm. And some people don't want to call it a new norm because things are always changing. Nothing will ever stay the same. So once again, I believe that God is a progressive God, and I believe that God has forced us outside of our place of comfortability we had become too comfortable inside of a sanctuary and because we had become too comfortable inside of a sanctuary we missed a lot of opportunities because we were too eager to get inside of a building there were so many people that we bypassed there were so many opportunities that we bypassed there were so many times that God put ministry before us and right in our faces and we bypassed it because we were too eager to go inside of a building. And because we have become so churchified and because we have become so comfortable inside of a sanctuary when the ministry is really outside of the four walls, God says now it's time you really don't have 
any choice but to come outside of the four walls and to still be effective and active in ministry. And so as we begin to look uh, at Acts chapter three, there is a story here about uh, a lame beggar, a lame beggar. He had a condition from his birth. He was born with a birth defect. He was born with a deficiency. He was born, as others would say, he was not normal. He had issues when he came into the world and the issues were beyond his own control. And so, and I noticed that the Bible does not give this lame beggar a name. And I believe that uh, it, the Bible is always intentional. The Bible is always intentional. The Bible didn't give this man a name uh, because this lame man in the Bible represents many of us. And so we can actually insert our name where this uh, man is called a beggar or a blind beggar. He had needs that needed to be met and he, were, he was not able to meet those needs on his own. And if we all are honest this morning, we all have needs that we cannot meet. We all are in a place at some point in our li lives or have been in a place to where there were needs that needed to be met that we had to look higher in order to get those needs met. We needed to look to God. You know, human strength could not help us in these moments. You know, so we learn how to pray in those moments. We learn how to look outside of ourselves for what we needed. We learn to look to God. And I believe even during this pandemic that people are realizing that I need God in my life. I don't need him as a co-pilot. I need him to be driving. I need him to be behind the steering wheel. I need him to be the director. I need him to be the CEO. I need him to be the decision maker. I need him to lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And so a lot of us don't understand that we need God until we're in a pandemic. A lot of us don't understand how much we need God until we are facing a crisis. And so this this man who's in the scripture, uh, the Bible calls him a a lame uh, beggar. Uh, I want you to look with me in verse one, and I want to show you uh, that this also represents the condition. Of the, uh, of the church or how the church was before COVID-19 is going to make perfectly good sense uh, if, if you follow me through the scriptures. Verse one says this. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple uh, at the ninth hour of the hour of prayer. OK, so they were going to church. They were going to church and they were going with the intentions of praying. You know, they they, they went to commune with God. Not only were they going to church, they were going where people were congregated. They were going where other people were headed. Uh, they were going to a gathering like we do on Sunday mornings. And in verse two, the scripture says, and a man who had been lame from his his mother's womb was being carried along. Now, I want you to notice that in the text that because of this man's deficiency and because of his inability to take care of himself, he had to depend on someone else to get him from A to B. So I need you as you listen to me to understand this, is that sometimes you will need people to intersect with you in order for you to get where you need to be. No man is an island. No woman is an island all by himself or herself. You will always need people in this life to help you get to where you need to be. I hear people say it so often. I don't need nobody. I I, I got God. You know what I'm saying? I, I have him. And because I have him, I don't need nobody else. That is so far from the truth because God works through people. You've never seen God physically. You've never laid your eyes on God. You've seen the evidence of him. But if you've ever noticed that he works through people, you know, so in essence, you will need people. You will need people. Somebody type that in. I do need other people. I do need other people. I need you to type that in because we need to come to the realization that God works through people. He works through many people will miss out on blessings because they think they don't need anybody. And to be honest, that is a pride issue. 
that is a pride issue. And the Bible says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so listen, listen to me. Whenever there is a dysfunction or a disability, it becomes an opportunity for God. Whenever there is a dysfunction and whenever there is a disability or inability, it becomes an opportunity for God. Wherever you have a deficit in your life, whether it's finances, whether you're in a relationship deficit, no matter what type of lack you have, whenever you are lacking in any area, it becomes an opportunity for God to show up and to show his hand and his face in your life. See, a lot of times when we're dealing with a deficit and when we're dealing with lack or dysfunction, we we solely depend on other people. We need to look to God and allow God to assign people to our dysfunction. God will assign people to your disability. See, usually whenever there is a disability, disadvantage or dysfunction, we become vulnerable. And when people become vulnerable, there are people who like to attach to your vulnerability. And so it's very important that if you understand you have a dysfunction, a vulnerability or disability or inability, that you depend on God to assign people to push you and elevate you and to get you from A to B. And so type this in. God uses a deficit to bring forth his glory. God will use a deficiency. God will use a disability to push forth his glory. Because at the end of the day, it's all about God getting the glory out of your life. And just because you might not be functioning at full capacity does not mean that God is going to leave you there. Because I believe, our church believe that God is a healer. Because we know too much about him to doubt him. We've seen him move on multiple occasions. We've seen people in ICU that God has touched and brought home. We've seen people heal from their infirmities and their sicknesses. We've seen God move in situations that seem like they were impossible to bounce back from. And so we know too much about our God to doubt him. And so God will use your deficit. God will use your issue to bring forth his glory. See, because when you're in a situation and you understand that people cannot help you and it becomes an opportunity for God to show up and to fix your situation and to turn your situation and turn your life and turn you into a, 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 a picture of what his grace looks like. And, and, and I need somebody to type this in. God will take your mess and turn it into a miracle. God will turn your take your mess and he will turn it into a miracle. And some of you, you're watching this live right now. You can testify that God took your messed up self. God took your messed up mindset. God took all of your mess that other folk are probably still talking about. And God turned your mess into a miracle. See, because if you got this thing all together and you got this thing all figured out, then you don't need God. God can work with somebody that's struggling. God can work with somebody who understands that they need him. God can work with somebody who, who will look to him and, and, and admit, Lord, I cannot do this on my own. Are y'all with me this morning? If you're with me, just type amen. I, I just need to know that you're understanding that God can't help you if you don't need help. But that's something that you have to come to grips with. That's something that you have to confess with your mouth that, Lord, I need you in this season in my life. I need you to move in my life. I need you to, to get me to where I need to be, Lord. I need my will to be to coincide with your will. I need to be in sync. I need to be in position and I need my posture to be right. I need my posture to be right. Not only do I need to be in position, but while I'm in position waiting for God to do what I need him to do in my life, I need to make sure that my mind is right. I need to make sure that my heart is right. And I need to make sure that even if God does not move when I want him to move, that I know that he's a he's an on time God. He might not show up when I want him to show up, but he's always on time.
God is never late. And he never misses an appointment. And see, unfortunately, some of us have a divine appointment with God that we try to cancel. And God said, no, you cancel your appointment, but you can never cancel mine. And so here it is. God will take your mess and he will turn your mess into a miracle. Now, let's look back at the text here. The text says here in uh, verse two. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, in order for him to beg alms of those who were entering into the church. Now, or the temple. Now, I want you to understand something here. I want you to I want you to imagine this right here. They're they're taking this man who cannot walk and somebody is dropping him off in front of the church doors. OK, and, and I believe I, you can look at this thing several different ways. Sometimes people do like to take advantage of people who go to church. Let's just be honest. Sometimes people do like to take try to take advantage of people who are going to church. So sometimes people will post up in front of church folk because they think everybody who goes to church is vulnerable. And I need somebody to type this in. I'm not that vulnerable. I don't need you to be vulnerable in this season. We need you to be wise. We need you to, to move in wisdom. We don't need you to be vulnerable. If you're going to be vulnerable to anybody, be vulnerable to God. Be vulnerable to the one who's going to supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Be vulnerable to the one who's going to make sure that your posture and your position is right. Be, be vulnerable to the one who's feeding you every day, who's waking you up faithfully. Be vulnerable to the one who's faithful even when you're not. Be vulnerable to the one who's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Be vulnerable to the one who has your best interest at heart. Be vulnerable to the one who's showing you your purpose and, and supplying all of your needs and making sure that your bills are paid and making sure that you got a roof over your head, making sure that you have food on the table, making sure that you're, that you are meeting all of your ends. Be vulnerable to him. Be vulnerable to him, not to people that's always out to use you. Not to people that's always out to get, but never giving. Have you ever ran across folk that, that their hand is always out? Their hand is always out to get something. But there's never a good season in their life to where they're in a position to give. If you're always taking and never giving that right, there's no balance to that. Something ain't right about it. So everybody struggles, but God does not leave his people in the struggle. If he's my shepherd and he's guided me to green pastures, then we ought to be asking the question, why have I not made it to the green pastures yet? Why, why am I always eating burnt grass? Why, why am I always on the low end of the totem pole? Why am I not experiencing elevation? Why do I not know God in a more intimate way? And it may have something to do with the relationship, or it may have something to do with your hearing, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you're not hearing God, then you'll always be out of position. When God, Listen, God works this way. Those of you who watch football and know anything about sports, I need you to, to understand this. When the quarterback throws the ball to the receiver, the receiver is running a route. And so when the quarterback uh, goes back and he throws, he's not throwing to a person. He's throwing to a position. So all the receiver needs to do is run his route. Somebody type this in. Run your route. Run your route. Run your route. I didn't say run your neighbor's route. See, because sometimes you could have people in your life that's directing you down a path that God never set for you. And some of us are so some of us are so bent on pleasing people that we will never be able to please God. So bent on getting affirmation and confirmation from other people and our hearing has become dull to what God is saying. It's time for you to grow up. It's time for you to grow spiritually. 
It's time for you to have an intimate, personal relationship with God and stop depending on a mediator, another person to always, uh, always try to, um, what do they try to do? They, they, they try to break things down to you and tell you what God is saying and you believe everything they say because you're not hearing God for yourself. You don't always need an interpreter when God is speaking to you through his word. I've never seen so many people that are so gullible and so vulnerable. Anything that anybody tells them, they believe it and they run with it rather than running to the word of God and listening to what God is saying to you. Because what God is saying to you may be totally different or in opposition of what the other person is telling you he's saying. So you got to learn to discern God's voice over the voice of your favorite prophet or your favorite prophetess or your favorite apostle or your favorite preacher or your favorite evangelist. You got to learn how to hear God for yourself. And some people need to ask the question, am I following God or am I following man? Am I following God or am I following the voices? Because everybody's voice is not assigned to your life. Everybody's voice is not assigned to your life. And there are even voices that are assigned to your life for a season and then they're gone. And when people are delivering a word to you that was given to them from God, then they should not hold you hostage just because they gave you a word in season. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he told the people that were standing around looking to unbind the man and let him go. What he was telling them is that just because you unwrapped him does not mean you can imprison him by telling him if it wasn't for me, then you wouldn't have been unwrapped. If it wasn't for my ministry, you wouldn't be who you are. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be. Yeah, God said, Jesus said, let him go. Let him go. And so I'm saying that to all you prophets, all you prophetess, all, all of you preachers, evangelists that are listening this morning. Just because you give somebody a word does not make them a servant to you. You're doing what God told you to do. And after you do it, you, you need to move on. You need to move on. So once again, uh, once again, this 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 lame beggar in Acts chapter three, because of his inability to get to where he needed to be on his own, he needed help. He needed help. And so what they did, they sat him in front of the gate called beautiful. OK, now the issue one of the issues that I think that we've had in a lot of our our churches is that we are so bent on going on the inside that we refuse to look around in the parking lot because because th this man, in essence, was sitting in the parking lot. And people were used to seeing him there and they knew that he was a beggar. And because they knew he was a beggar, many of them just passed by the man because they were not able to discern that his real issue was not money. See, a lot of people think that their issue is money. Now, your issue is not money all the time. Sometimes your issue is deeper than money. And if you get the deeper things fixed, then you will have some money. You'll make some money, you know, because what God will do, God will give you the ability to go out and to make money, you know. But if you have inner struggles and inner demons that you refuse to deal with, it might be messing with your pockets and you don't even know it. And so if, if, if your inability is causing you to lack in your pockets, then that means that you will run to other people to meet your your financial need when really your need is, is is deeper than that. Your real issue is deeper than that. You know, so this man was sitting at the gate and it was their custom. You know, if you had a disability, you sit him in front of the temple because after all, church people are good people, right? If anybody's going to give you some money, it's going to be somebody who loved the Lord, right? That, so that's what people think. But but back to this, we have to be careful that we are not so bent on going inside of a building and worshiping God while at the same time we're bypassing people who really need him. Because this man right here is somebody that I never would have walked by. This man sitting at the temple, I, you know, as a matter of fact, when we were giving hot dogs out this week, last week, Maurice Willis, there was a man that came over there 
um, he came to, to eat, of course, and Maurice re uh, recognized his discernment kicked in and he realized that this man's issue was not food. Yes, we fed him, but at the same time, he needed prayer. This man was a cop in Miami, Florida, and his whole life took a turn. And now he's on the streets living in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He probably never thought that he would be in the situation that he's in. But you know what? We would have missed his real need for prayer if we would have thought that meeting his need to eat was really his need. No, it was deeper than that. So let's look back at this text right here. Okay. God, somebody typed this in. God is interested in people in the parking lot. I'm just, I'm messing some of y'all church folk up because, because some of y'all think that God is only interested in the people inside the sanctuary. But, but I need you to understand that God is interested in the people in the parking lot. God is interested in the people who may not ever walk into a sanctuary. God is interested in people that don't look like you. God is interested in people who might not be able like you. He's interested in outcasts. God is interested in the people that are not socially accepted. God is interested in the underdog. I need you to hear me. God is not just interested in people that got it all together or appear to have it all together. He said that he did not come for the righteous. He came for those that need a physician. So, so in essence, let me say it this way. The church is a hospital. And if you are not sick, then why are you coming to church? If you got it all together, you don't need God. If you got it all together, you don't need church. If you got it all together, you don't need a word. If you got it all together, you don't need a pastor. If you got it all together, you don't need a shepherd. But if you know that you have underlying issues, then you know you need a savior. God is interested in the people in the parking lot. And for those of you who are on this live and you might consider yourself one of the people in the parking lot, let me tell you this. God wants to bring you closer. God wants to bring you closer. Zacchaeus, y'all, in Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus climbed up in a tree so he could see Jesus. Jesus had a whole crowd around him. He bypassed the crowd, looked up, and that man that had been rejected, that man who was a social outcast, Jesus looked up in that tree and said, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree because today I need to go home with you. And so God is interested in those people that the church world might not be interested in. And for those of you that got gang banger uh, nephews and nieces and sons and daughters <clears throat> and people that are still on the block struggling, let me tell you something. God can save them too. God can save them too. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons the Bible did not put a name here for this blind beggar is so that we can insert our name because at some point in life, we've been just like this man. We needed to be healed. We needed our souls healed. We needed our spirit healed. We needed our lives healed. But somebody has to be able to see deeper than the surface. I've never seen so many people that claim to be prophetic and claim to be deep and claim to, to be discerning. And they'll walk right past a basic need because it ain't surface. Let me move forward with this text here. I'm almost done. In verse four, I want you to see something. No, look at verse three. In verse three, when when he saw when this man saw uh, Peter along with John. No, in verse three, when he saw Peter and John about to go into the to the temple, the church. Uh, he he began asking to receive alms. The man began to beg from. Uh, Peter and John as they were walking into the church. Uh, verse four says, but Peter, along with John, they fix, fix his gaze on him and said, look at us. In other words, they locked in on this man who was probably looking down. Nobody had probably even paid this man any attention in so long because either you're going to give or you're not. But 
But Peter and John, they stopped. And first of all, they paid attention to the man in the parking lot. They paid attention to the man in the parking lot. Not only did they pay attention to the man in the parking lot, but they 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 fixed their gaze on him. They fi- that meant that they really took a deeper look. Somebody type this in. Look deeper. Look deeper. Because sometimes what you see is really not what it is. At times you have to walk by the spirit and not by by what you see. Peter and John, they stopped, they looked at this man, and they sensed that something deeper is going on with this man. I've never seen such an undiscerning generation of churchgoers. Can't discern nothing. Vulnerable. You know, that's why it's very important to have a real relationship with God and and be filled with the spirit so that you can discern things that people aren't saying. You can only do that by having a real relationship with him. You got to look deeper. And so Peter them did. They looked deeper. And verse five, they said, and and he began to give them. he, He began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Now, listen. Some people will only give you their attention if it's going to profit them something. Some people will only give you their undivided attention if it means it's going to be a come up for them. Yeah, yeah. I call those leeches. They only come around so they can come up. And some people's whole life is based on coming up off other people, right? But this man right here, he, he had a he had a deeper issue. Now he began to beg for them from them, and he gave them his full attention. But look at what Peter said in verse six. In verse six, but Peter said, "I do not possess silver and gold." That's what he says. He says, "But what I do have, I give to you." Listen to what Peter is saying. They said, we don't have money. We don't have silver. We don't have gold. We don't have riches. He says, but I do have something that God gave me. He said, I I, I do have something more valuable than silver and gold. I'm talking to somebody this morning because you think that your money is something. You think that because you can meet a financial need, that is something. But some people, you can meet their financial need and their need, they'll need more finances later. But Peter and John had something that money couldn't buy. They had something that money couldn't buy. Nobody cares about how much money you got. Nobody cares how you stack it. Nobody cares about that. Because most people's needs are deeper than your pockets because their need is spiritual and you can't meet a spiritual need with financial, with finances. You can't meet a spiritual need with your finances. And Peter and John told him that we don't have silver and gold. He says, but I do have something to offer. I need somebody to type that in. I do have something to offer. You might not be, you may not be running with the elite. You might be making minimum wage on your job. You might be struggling with your finances, but hear what I'm saying. You still have something to offer. Even if it's an encouraging word, even if it's just a hug, even if it's just an embrace, even if it's just a conversation, or even if it's just taking a real look at the individual without getting caught up in their deficit or their dysfunction. Because some people can't see past a person's dysfunction. Some people still talking about what you used to be. They can't see past how you used to struggle. They still gathering around at tables talking about 
do you know he used to do this or do, do you know that she used to do this? Some people still tripping over your past. How are you tripping over my past? How are you tripping over somebody else's past? How are you tripping over another individual's uh, past issues when they are no longer even tripping over it themselves? Why are people still tripping up over, over the stuff that you used to do and the places you used to be and the things you used to say? If I can get over it, then you ought to be able to get over it. If God can get over it, then you ought to be able to get over it. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, all things are new. So, uh... You have to see past the person's issue and see the person. You have to see the person. Have, when people come to you for counsel and when people come to you with their problem, you have to be able, first of all, to handle both the person and the problem. You have to be able to handle the person and the problem. Some people get caught up in trying to be a problem solver and they forget that there is a person attached to the problem. There is a person. You can't just fix the issue and not try to help fix the person. Whew, Lord have mercy. You, you have to be able to handle them both. Because the problem is attached to the person and you can sometimes solve the problem and leave the person in a wreck. And that's why I say that you got to be able to handle both. Now, <laughs> so they say I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but I do have a spiritual gift. I do. I am gifted. God has touched me because if you go back and you look at Acts chapter one, two, leading up to chapter three, uh, the Holy Spirit, Jesus has sent back to indwell the people. And so and so Peter and John were operating uh, in the spirit that had come to fill God's people. You ought to always operate in the spirit, because if you operate in the spirit, your ministry will be more effective. You can't operate in your feelings and operate in your flesh and try and think that it's going to be effective. You have to be able to walk in the spirit so that you give God room to do what he needs to do through you. Because when you are filled with the spirit, it is taking the place of your flesh. And that's why the spirit, that's why the scripture says be filled with the spirit and not in the flesh. So this is what Peter them said in verse six. Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give you. He says in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk, walk. Listen, Peter and John were able to see this man walking in the spirit. They were able to see they would not allow his deficiency to stop them from believing that this man could walk. Nobody had ever told this man that he had the ability to walk until somebody's spirit feel did not stumble over his condition. Many of you can be healed. Many of you will outlive people's expectation based on what your condition is. Many of you will surpass. God is going to heal and touch many of you. But you got to make sure that you are not listening to people that will agree with your condition and, and make you believe that this is it for you. Because it's not it for you. As long as God is still on the throne, as long as all power is still in his hand, as long as he is still God all by himself, as long as Jesus is seated in the, in the right hand of the majesty making intercession for you, there's always, there's always a chance. It's never too late. It's never over. And so, 
He says in the name, not in the name of Peter, not in the name of John, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he commanded him to walk. So there are some problems that we face in life that we have to speak to and we have to speak with the authoritative voice and, and the power that God has given us. If you are in ministry and you speak with a frail, weak voice and there is no power in your preaching, there is no power in your witness, there is no authority in your words, then that's why people aren't healed. Because usually when people believe this themselves, they can speak it with authority. But if you don't believe it and you're still struggling with this yourself, that's why when it comes out of your mouth, nobody is being affected by it in a positive way. Nobody is experiencing power or healing because your voice is too weak. You don't believe what you're preaching. You don't believe what you say. Peter and John, they believed it. And that's why they say in the name of Jesus, they said it with boldness. Type this in. You have to be bold. You have to be bold. This is not a season for cowards. This is not a season. Uh, this is not a season for people who are timid. This is a season for people to speak boldly in the midst of a of a pandemic. I got a couple of more verses, then we're going to be out of here. And, and verse seven, the scripture says, and seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up. And so you can't just be speaking to people that you are not willing to assist. At some point, you have to extend your hand. At some point, you have to extend your hand. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. You have to be willing to extend your hand and to touch people who have been abandoned. There's no telling how long it had been since this man had, had felt the touch of somebody who believed that his condition could change. And so I believe that when Peter and John grabbed this man to assist him, grabbed him by his right hand and pulled him out of that chair. I believe that the virtue that they was walking in was transferred to this man who had a lame condition. I wonder if virtue is being transferred from you. You say you believe the Lord. You say that you are a follower of Jesus. You say that you are walking in power. You, you say that you are spirit filled. And I just can't help but to ask you how much of that is being transferred to other people. Because, the, because when you show up, if you are who you say you are, when you show up, things should never be the same, the same way they were before you got there. There ought to be a shift in the atmosphere just because you showed up. Sometimes your presence ought to shake the very core of the atmosphere that you just walked in. That's when you know that you know that you know that somebody is spirit filled. And let me just drop this on you. Let me just drop this on you. Listen to this. There are people who are still spirit filled, even though you don't like them. Some of us think that God abandons people we don't like. Church folk. Some of you all believe that God abandons abandoned people that you don't like. Just because y'all are not on good terms does not mean that God ain't using them. <laughs> Only you think like that, not God. Verse 8. Here it is. With a leap, he stood upright and began, Lord have mercy. Now, let me back up to verse seven. I'm getting too excited. They said, and seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. God gave him strength in the place that he had the weakness. God replaced his weakness with strength. Remember, the man had never walked before. His ankles probably were, what do you call it when a person 
haven't walked in a long time. They, they have no movement, no muscle movement, no, no nothing. But here, all of a sudden, because somebody spoke into his life, somebody commanded that he come out of his present condition. God moved in this man's life, strengthened his ankles. Now he's doing things that he never was able to do before. And this is this is where it gets it gets tricky. I wonder if this man could have walked long time ago. If church people wasn't busy bypassing him because they're so eager to go into the sanctuary. This man had been in the parking lot all this time, all this time. And to some people, they were dressed to impress. They're going into the synagogue. They're going into the temple. They're going to get their praise on. They're going to worship and they're bypassing people in the parking lot. They got their health. They got their strength. They got money in the bank. And so this man's need is not a necessity. To, to them, they in church bypassing the people that really need God. And I'm convinced now that some people. It's hard for them to find God because they cannot find God in God's people. They have a problem seeing him because they cannot see him in his people. They have a problem coming to church. Because church folk act funny. They have a problem. Because some folk are so conditioned to believe. Some people about to lose their minds. Because they believe that, oh, the church is under attack. The church is closed. No, the church is still open. The church is still open and God is still moving. And God is still healing. And God is still being God. But you're so conditioned to a building that you think that just because the building is shut down, that the gates of heaven and that God's work is has ceased to go forward. But I need you to understand that God is still moving and God is still healing people like this man in the parking lot. And so the next time you you go into a sanctuary. Don't forget to look around in the parking lot. Because this man and his condition had been the same for so long because church people have been passing him by. This is the man. This is the ministry. People like him is who the Lord is eager. And when this man received his healing, this is what happened. Finish reading the story. When this man got his healing, you know what he did? He went to church. He went the he went to church. And guess what? The people in the church could not believe that this was the man sitting outside the door begging alms. And so there's the issue right there. They didn't believe he could be healed. And now he's in there worshiping and jumping around and doing all this stuff that he could not do before. And they're surprised. You know what that tells me? They didn't believe in the power of God in the first place. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe it because when God takes your mess and turn it into a miracle, the first thing you ought to do is not question. Was that so and so? No, you need to be giving God praise for what he's done. You need to be giving God praise for what he's done. And then on top of that, after Peter and John, God used them to heal this man. The religious leaders had a problem with it. And I said, Lord, this this is crazy. It seemed like the people that should be. Promoting your agenda and happy that you are still moving and working are the people that's posing the issue. And so don't you be that person that uh, bypassed the parking lot just to go into the sanctuary because the work, the real work is not in the building. The real work is in the parking lot. And I need you to type that in as I close out this video. The real work is in the parking lot. But some people are too eager to be seen on the inside. That they rush into the doors and bypass the people in the parking lot. And so um, there it is. There it is. The parking lot ministry. 
everybody's not called to the sanctuary. Some people are called to the streets. Some people are called to the parking lot. Some people are called to the underdog. And you know what? Those are the type of people that's not going to get too much attention because everybody wants the big platform. God says, y'all standing up so high on that platform that if you fell off of it, it'll break your neck. Don't forget the people on the ground on your way to the top. Bring somebody with you. Well, I want to extend an invitation here this morning. There may be someone here who does not know the Lord as personal Lord and Savior. We want to give you the opportunity to give your life to him. And please share the video. By all means, please share it because somebody needs to know that their deficiency is not the end, that their dysfunction, their deficit is not it for them. God can still heal them. God can still move. God can still take their mess and turn it into a miracle. But I want to give you the opportunity to give your life to Christ. All you have to do is simply ask him to come in, you know, come in. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Every day is a day of salvation. God is still saving people. God is still bringing people out of their mess. God is still doing wondrous things, you know, uh, but are you willing? Are you willing to open the doors of your heart and let God in so that he can change your life forever? Are you willing? Are you ready? Amen. I got signs falling down, but yeah. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yep. But if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, he said, you shall be saved. Tomorrow is not promised. The Bible says that life is a vapor. We are here one moment. We can be gone the next. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Do you have a real relationship? with the Lord because if you does there's no way it won't exude through your actions there's no way and for those of you uh, who want to give your life to Christ all you have to do just let us know send us an inbox and let us know that you've accepted Christ you've asked him to come into your life and to be and to lead you and to guide you and to cover you and to um, and to to pluck you out of yourself and to pluck you out of the hand of the enemy and to prop you up as a trophy of his grace and use you for the promotion of his kingdom and his agenda. If that's you, just let us know. Don't care how bad it's been or what you've been through. You are the type of person that God is drawn to. God is drawn to people with a past. He's drawn to you. He loves you because he knows that once he cleans you up and puts you back out there, that people are going to be shocked that is you. Please share this video. God is able to heal to the utmost. And once again, if you want to give to the church, you can do so by cash apping Inner Peace Church. Or you can uh, text give to 423-301-5545. Or you can go to our website, which is www.innerpeacechurch.org. And you can give online. Um, but if you want to become a part of our virtual church, you can also inbox me and I will send your name uh, and your information to um, to our administrators and they will get you all set up. We thank God for you. We thank God for your commitment. We thank you for your support. We thank you for loving us and we thank you for allowing us to love you back. We love our community. We love our extended family. Uh, we love IPC. We love Chattanooga. We love all the surrounding areas. We love our virtual church members. We love you all. And if we could ever be of any assistance to you, all you have to do is let us know. I'm Pastor King. I'm going to pray us out and we'll talk to you soon. Father, we thank you for your hand of mercy, your grace. We thank you for reminding us that just as you healed this man who was born with a dysfunction or disability from his birth, you can heal us also. We give you honor for what you have not done yet. We know that you are working. We know that you are busy uh, healing and delivering your people. We know that you are still on the throne. We know that you are still in total control. We love you, God, for first loving us. We thank you for giving your son, Jesus, to die on that old rugged cross for us. For without the shedding of his blood, 
there will be no remission of sin. We thank you for forgiveness today. We thank you for a brand new start. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness toward us. We pray for those who are in the hospitals, those who are recovering from their sicknesses. We thank you for your healing power that is going all across this land. We pray for every pastor, every church, uh, the leaders of our country. We pray for every family, God. We pray that you would touch and move the way you are have been doing and still will continue to do. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I will talk to you all soon. Share this video. I love you. I'm PK.